years ago Got son came to show The father's love That he has for this world Lost in sin Helping the hopeless Jesus Won the victory that we could not win There is no greater Love than His sacrificial death for you and me If he so loved us We must Love each other just like Calvary Gotta love each other Like the Lord Gotta love each other Like the Lord Love, love, love Love, love, love everyone and uh, could you turn your Bibles to 1st John chapter 1 verse 5 in my translation as well as your Bibles and if all of you could keep in prayer my good friend Titus Thompson who fractured his ankle riding bikes with us the other day and uh, so um, if you could keep that in prayer that he's not going to be out too long because I he's my buck my biking buddy and also, I don't want him to his 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 physique, his his, le his muscular physique, to start to diminish in any way. He's all concerned about that his powerful legs will look diminished in a cast for a while. So, but anyways, he thinks he's Superman, I think. But anyways, <laughs> just kidding. So keep Titus in prayer. I feel bad for him. It's, here we are, just beginning the good weather, and he goes and fractures his ankle. It was very uh, innocuous the way it happened. So, anyways. Um, Let's uh, keep, uh, keep uh, him in prayer. And uh, you, I said you should be at 1 John 1, 5. We're going to continue with our study of 1 John 1, 9 and the confession of sins. And we've been, we actually finished the verse, uh, looking at the verse a while ago, but we've been do going to, uh, into various subjects uh, uh, with uh, different issues regarding confession of sin. And one of those uh, issues uh, is uh, restitution. A lot of times, as we'll see this evening, a lot of times people, I've seen this a number, numbers, number, uh, numerous times with Christians where, uh, they, you know, they, they go to that passage in Psalm 51, which we'll talk about, you know, I've confessed, I've sinned against you and you alone, Lord. And so they a lot of people misapply that, misinterpret that and say, oh, well, if, I, if I've, you know, slandered somebody or I've stolen from somebody or lied about somebody, you know, all I have to do is confess my sin to the Father. You know, and that's not what the Bible teaches. You have to confess your sin to the Father, and you have to uh, do uh, what we call um, 
employ restitution, meaning uh, you know if you you know slandered, uh, you stole from somebody, you have to give back that money uh, that you stole. In fact, the Bible talks about giving more on top of what you stole to back to the person, uh, and then in, in confessing your sins to God. So that uh, this is very important because a lot of a lot of Christians are sitting against each other and other people, and they're confessing the sin, but they're not doing right and not. Uh, uh, offering restitution, uh, whether it's an apology or, you know, money back for they stole or whatever, or, you know, going to the people you slandered this person to about, to, uh, about you, slandered, you slandered somebody in the body of Christ or somebody who's not in the body of Christ, and all those people you slandered them uh, to, you go back and, you know, hey, I apologize, I lied about this person, I'm slandering them, it was wrong for me to do. They should, we're not seeing that in the body of Christ, and it's very damaging and uh, these people are uh, are going to be under discipline from God because of that, and a lot are. So uh, we need to uh, take seriously this subject here this evening. So uh, restitution is in uh, uh, the confession of sin is what we'll be looking at here this evening. We're almost really ready to move on to verse ten. We will. Uh, we have I think uh, a couple more, well, another week's lesson uh, this week, and then we and a couple of lessons next week before we move on to 1 John 1, 10 and finish 1 John chapter 1. But uh, tomorrow we'll be noting the, in the unpardonable sin, and uh, because we're talking about the confession of sin, well, the Bible also teaches there's an unpardonable sin, so how does that relate to 1 John 1, 9 and the confession of sin? And then the last two subje uh, subjects I want to cover with relation to 1 John 1, 9 is, uh, we'll cover Thursday, uh, is, uh, one of them is, uh, is 1 John 1, 9 addressed to unbelievers? Because there's some people who are teaching out there that you don't have to confess your sins, and 1 John 1, 9 is not written to believers, but unbelievers, which is absolute joke. So uh, we're going to go and show that, uh, how that is wrong, because you will run into that. One way or the other, you're going to run into that from some people. Somewhere down the line, you'll run into people, and that's old as the hills, that false doctrine, false interpretation. And then lastly, we'll be noting is the confession of sin related to the filling of the Spirit. So, and then we move on to verse 10. So all of these things I'm we're talking about are very, very important. Uh, we talked about... Uh, thus far in uh, the basis for the forgiveness of sins, uh, the results of, of us confessing our sins. Um, we also noted uh, that the conf confession of sin is related to repentance for the believer. We've also studied that confession of sin prevents God from disciplining us, uh, punishing us. So uh, very, very important subjects we've been covering here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So let's take a moment to sign the prayer. As is our custom, we do this so that we can get ourselves prepared to hear what the Spirit is going to say to us through the communication of the Word of God. If we're out of fellowship uh, with God because of unconfessed sin, uh, we are not going to listen, be able to listen to, we can hear what the Word of God is saying, but we're not going to understand what the Spirit is saying to us because the Word of God is spiritual phenomena. So if you're out of fellowship with God, forget about trying to apply what you, and understand what you're being taught in Bible class. Uh, you're basically... Uh, somebody who is a natural-minded person at that point when you're out of fellowship. So we confess our sins, and according to 1 John 1, 9, which we've been learning, uh, we're restored to fellowship with God, and we, as we also learn, we're restored based upon the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, the merit of him and his death on the cross. And so we're restored to fellowship, and we maintain the fellowship by obeying the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through the, uh, the, the word of God, which he's inspired, and that's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18, as we'll see. Uh, next week, and uh, and uh, to be filled with the Spirit, and also Colossians 3.16, to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you, Father, for another day to fellowship in your word, to learn of your plan, uh, to become like your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this study in 1 John, and in particular 1 John 1, 9. And we pray that you would bless us in this study with relation to the subject of restitution and the confession of sins. We pray, Father, that each person in the audience would be spoken to here this evening. 
And we also pray, Father, that you would, uh, the, the Spirit would speak to us as individuals and as a corporate unit. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would help them to understand the information that they'll be receiving in the Word of God and guide them in the application. We pray that you would empower me to communicate accurately your Word so that this could take place. And uh, we also pray, Father, that uh, uh, you would help uh, Titus with the sound, the recordings, the video, the audio. We thank you for his service and the wisdom you give him in that area and the technology and the people taking advantage of the technology. Uh, we thank you for Titus and Jody's uh, Thompson hospitality and opening up their home four days a week. And uh, we thank you, Father, for all the logistical grace blessings that you've given to us to keep going here in Iowa. And uh, we uh, also pray, we lift up Titus, we pray that you would heal him of his fractured ankle, and we pray it won't be uh, out too long uh, in, uh, with the, uh, the problem with his leg. So we pray for that uh, area. We give, pray that you give the doctors and nurses uh, wisdom in treating him in that area. And we thank you that he wasn't more, even more seriously hurt out there riding his bike. So uh, we pray for this service and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, you should be at 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to read from the Net Bible, uh, 1 John 1, 5 to 1 John 2, 2, because they constitute a single paragraph, these verses. And, uh, and also I want to read, as I've been doing, my translation of, um, of these verses. I remember uh, what we got on the website, I just put it on the website, but I have an expanded translation of the of these of this of this book and uh, also a regular translation it's, you'll you'll notice the difference uh, the, it's pretty self-explanatory expanded translation is a little bit more um, a little bit wordier much more explicit than the regular translation so i use the regular translation in our, our study because it's more readable that's why so uh, that's why i kind of decided to put it together like that uh, with the two different types of translation. So, 1 John 1, 5 in the Net Bible says, Now this is the gospel message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Speaking of the holiness of God from a negative and positive perspective. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet keep on walking in the darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we do not bear the guilt of sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. Now, let's read uh, those same verses in my translation. Now, this is the message which we have heard from him, so that we are now imparting to each of you, namely that God is light. Indeed, in him there is absolutely no darkness, none whatsoever. If any of us enters into making the claim that we've been experiencing fellowship with him, yet we've been living in the darkness, then we are lying to ourselves. Consequently, we are unequivocally not practicing the truth. On the other hand, if any of us does at any time live in this light, as he himself is that light, then we are experiencing fellowship with one another. Consequently, the blood of Jesus, his son, does cause each one of us to be purified from each and every sin. If any of us enters into making the claim that we have never experienced the guilt of sin, then we're deceiving ourselves. Consequently, the truth is unequivocally not existing in us. If any of us does at any time confess our sins, he is characterized as being faithful as well as just to forgive these sins for the benefit of each one of us. In other words, to purify each one of us from each and every unrighteous thought, word, or action. If any of us enters into making the claim that we have never sinned, then we are making him out to be a liar. Consequently, his word is unequivocally not existing in us. Then it says in verse 1 of chapter 2, My dear children, I am presently writing these things for the benefit of each of you, in order that each of you would not enter into committing a sin. However, if anyone enters into committing a sin, we possess an advocate with the Father, namely Jesus, who is the Christ, who is a righteous person. For you see, he himself is the propitiatory sacrifice for our sins, indeed by no means for ours only, but in fact also for the entire 
world. So we, there we have it in my translation and the Net Bible. Now, when our subject is the confession of sin in relation to restitution. When a believer confesses their sins, they also must make sure that if their sin or sins hurts a, another person in some way, that they make restitution for this. In other words, what I mean by this is if a believer steals from another person, let's say the sin is stealing, if they steal from another person, they not only must confess their sin to the Father, but also they must make restitution to the party they have stolen from, meaning pay them back. And by the way, uh, we're going to see uh, that it, uh, there's even more on top of that which you have stolen from them. When you get back, there should be, there's another fifth that goes on top of that. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ taught his disciples the doctrine of, of restitution. It's in the Old Testament as we'll see. It's also taught by Jesus. It's found in the Gospels. Look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 21 please. Matthew chapter 5 verse Matthew 5, 21, I'm going to read for the Net Bible. You have heard, Jesus said, and this is on his ser in his Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said to an older generation, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subjected to judgment. But I say to you that any anyone who is angry with a brother will be subjected to, ju to judgment, and whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council, and whoever says fool will be sent to fiery hell. So that if you bring your gift to the altar... To worship God. And this is the Jewish form of worship in the, in the temple. And there remember that your brother has something against you. Obviously because you sinned against them. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. And then come and present your gift. So basically what he's saying is. Don't try to worship. This is in the context of the Jewish worship in the temple. He said, don't bother going bringing your gift to God in the temple to, as an expression of worship when your brother has something against you, meaning you've sinned against them, and so he is, whether, whatever that sin was, maybe you stole from them, maybe you lied about them, or stole, uh, 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 slandered them, something like that. You, you go and reconcile with your brother first, because I'm not going to accept your worship if you haven't done that. So basically... Again, if you, could, if you sinned against your brother, as I said my point earlier, if you go and sin against your brother or sister in Christ, or anybody for that matter, non-believer, and let's say it's stealing, uh, if first you've got to confess the sin to God, but you also, because you sinned against your brother or uh, your neighbor, unbeliever or uh, believer, you sinned against them, you need to pay them back what you stole from them. So, Because otherwise, God's not going to accept your worship of him. He's not going to have fellowship with you. And this is, a, I've told you before, many Christians are, being, are under discipline from God because they re, un, are either, uh, they're, not ta they're taught this, but they're not applying this. And they, in fact, it's just common sense. And for instance, anytime, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say I, I, I did something to Titus, and there's been things, I, I apologize to Titus. I said something stupid or whatever. I got mad at him or something or whatever. And I go back and I apologize to him. It's just, but they're so, the, 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 it's unbelievable. And part of it is because they're being, they're being taught incorrectly for, uh, that, oh, I've sinned against God and God only. So therefore, tough luck for the person I just, you know, verbally abused or I got angry with unjustly or whatever and or stole from or slandered. Tough luck for them. That's not right. That's not right. If you're not right with your neighbor or your fellow believer in Christ, you're not right with God. This is what Jesus is saying. Very, very important we understand that. that because otherwise, you're just going to get disciplined by God and you're going to be taught a lesson. And meaning, you know, what God will do is, okay, you, you do this to somebody, well, I'm going to bring in a situation where that's going to be done to you. And he does that. He, that's God's justice. Uh, people talk about coincidences and all this kind of stuff. No, it's the providence of God. So some people propose in the body of Christ that when the believer sins against another person, that they, that they need only to confess this offense to God, who then freely forgives them, without any need to seek forgiveness or to resolve the offended horizontal relationship. What do I, what's the horizontal relationship? 
your relationship to people. So, uh, you, you know, when, if, you, if you sin against your brother and sister in Christ, or it doesn't have to be a, a brother or sister in Christ, it can be a non-believer. If you sin against them, you go and apologize to them. And people who are proud and arrogant can't do that, won't do that. Well, you're going to get disciplined by God for that. You go and apologize. That's what James is talking about. Confess your sins to one another. So some make the claim also in the body of Christ that the death of Christ brings experiential forgiveness before God and before one's fellow human being without any further resolution or restitution between one's fellow human being. These proponents argue that for every sin and crime, one only needs to confess to God for to total forgiveness experientially. The victim is then required to forgive based upon, solely upon, the positional forgiveness that they have personally received in Jesus Christ. And this view is proposed from faulty interpretations of two passages. Look at Ephesians, I'll show you a couple of these two. Look at Ephesians 4.32. Uh, actually, start at verse 30. We'll pick it up there in context. Ephesians 4.30. So we're going to go to this passage and Colossians 3.1. And the reason why is because the, there are some people in, that teach that for every sin and crime, one only need to confess to God for total forgiveness from him experientially. The victim then, the person you, that, was, you, that was sinned against, is required to forgive based solely upon the positional forgiveness that they have received personally in Christ. And this view is proposed from faulty interpretations of two passages. It says in Ephesians 4.30, and I'm reading again from the Ned Bible, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You must put away every kind of bitterness, anger, wrath, quarreling, and evil and slanderous talks, the sins of the tongue. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another just as God in Christ also forgave you. There's the positional forgiveness. So based upon the fact that God has forgiven you, you who are the victim are to forgive them. And that's true. But the person who has been the, 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 who's the guilty party needs to go and apologize or provide, provide some kind of restitution, whatever fits the sin, the crime, and, then, and confess his sins, and then he'll be restored to fellowship with God. But if he hasn't reconciled with his, the person he has uh, mistreated and sinned against, God's not going to have fellowship with them. So we need to understand that. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. I think it's Colossians 3.1. Yeah, look at Ephesians, excuse me, it's Colossians 3.12. There's a typo of my notes. Look at Colossians 3.12. The passage is actually going to be found in verse 13. I'll pick it up in verse 12. Colossians 3.12, we've studied this passage. And we get quite a bit of hits on this, on this particular, uh, we get quite a bit of hits on this uh, study in Colossians. A huge number of hits, which is quite encouraging. Colossians 3.12, therefore is the elect of God, holy and dearly beloved, in this class, is, Colossians 3.12 is one of the big ones, therefore is the elect of God, holy and dearly, dearly loved, clothe yourselves with a heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if someone happens to have a complaint against anyone else, just as the Lord is forgiving you, so also you should forgive others. So, again, the point I made, we took you to those two passages because, again, the point I made is that some are teaching in the body of Christ that for every sin and crime, one only needs to confess to God for, uh, for uh, the sin, for total forgiveness experientially. The victim, the one who sinned against, is then required to forgive based solely upon the positional forgiveness that they have personally received in Christ, and that's true. And, but the problem is they're leaving something out. The people, the person... Yeah, the person who's the victim has to forgive you because God in Christ has forgiven you. But you got to do something for the victim. Apologize or whatever, pay him back the money you stole from them or go in, a, uh, you know, patch things up with the people you uh, slandered them to. So if we carry this view to its logical M, 
The victim, must, the one who sinned against, must forgive and seek restoration with the perpetrator solely because of the forgiveness of Christ. Thus the thief steals, confesses to God, who supposedly totally forgives them, but tough luck for the victim who's lost real property or a reputation. People don't realize that slandering somebody, you, you, a lot of people in the body of Christ, and that, I tell you, a lot of pastors uh, have lost, and, and just you see this in politics, everywhere, anybody in public life. Uh, we saw it with Tom Brady. I mean, that guy was slanted up and down. Although there was no solid evidence, anything that he deflated footballs or anything, but they slanted his character. Now, it's like he has kids, you know. He has a family. His father was extremely un upset with that. But we laughed that up because, oh, he's a public figure. Like, this person, he's not a human being. You know, I know what it's like to have my... What happens is, your, uh, your uh, people, you slant your, get your reputation slanted, and there's no way of getting that back with people. Because people will believe whatever they hear and they don't give you the benefit of the doubt and listen to your side of the story. And so they end up, so what ends up happening is that a person's reputation is ruined with a lot of people. It happens all the time, especially in our country, and it's happening right now in the body of Christ today as we speak. It happens all the time in the church. So the slander libels, devastates his target, and confesses to God who supposedly totally forgives them, but tough luck again for the victim with a ruined reputation. In the case of sin against one's fellow human being, those who hold that confession to God alone is all that is necessary for forgiveness in the experiential sense, remove the basis for criminal law. Isn't there restitution in criminal law? Yeah. They also remove the basis of restitution to victims, and some holding this view include in their logic a faulty interpretation of David's prayer of confession in Psalm 51. Look at Psalm 51. I hear this used. I used it too years ago. That's how I was taught. But I wasn't taught the whole story. And I'm not saying that where I was taught this, that there was, no, they, they were taught, they, were, they weren't given the whole story either, those who taught me. Look at Psalm 51, verse 1. So some people say, okay, I slandered somebody, I stole money from them, I'll confess it, and I don't have to do any restitution, and they use Psalm 51 verse 4 to support their, their position. Psalm 51 1, have mercy on me, O God, because of your loyal love, this is David writing, because of your great compassion, wipe, wipe away my rebellious acts, wash away my wrongdoing, cleanse me of my sin. For I am aware of my rebellious acts. I am forever conscious of my sin. Against you, you above all, I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. So you are just when you confront me. You are right when you condemn me. Now stop there. That is true. All sin is against God. But a lot of sin is against the people in our lives. We come in contact with her at work, at home, church. So... There's another relationship, the there's one thing with God, the vertical relationship, but the horizontal, our horizontal relationships with people, if we've slandered, stolen, whatever, lied about somebody, whatever it is, uh, we need to uh, reconcile with them. And that would be an apology or whatever, the money's involved, paying them back. Go on, if, you, if you slandered somebody to somebody else, go to the people you slandered them to. You know, you said, oh, uh, uh, Pastor Bill was this, that, and the other thing. Go to that person and apologize for lying about Pastor Bill or slandering something like uh, him in some way, defaming his character. It could be anybody in the body of Christ. I'm just using my name as an example. But don't, you can't, don't say, oh, I've, I use this passage. I sinned against you, God, so they're tough luck. Uh, I can confess my sins to you, uh, even though I injured somebody's reputation or took some money from them, and that tough luck for that victim. That's not what this passage is saying. It's not even speaking about, it's, it's not giving you the whole story. It's talking, David just talking about his relationship to God here. There are other passages in the Bible that tell you, yeah, there's your relationship with God, and there's a relationship with people, and if your relationship with people is not right because if you sinned against them, don't expect that fellowship with God. He's not going to have fellowship with you. If you're wrong with people, meaning you've sinned against them and have not uh, offered restitution to those victims that you sinned against, then don't, you're not having fellowship with God. You will not. You will not. And that's very important because if you are, that's going to lead to discipline. 
So uh, we need to be very, very humble in the way we treat each other, and very considerate of each other, and be careful how we treat each other. And if we do sin against each other, which we will do, a lot of times the restitution would involve an apology. You know, uh, you get in an argument, you say unkind things to each other, husbands and wives get into this, children and their parents, pastors, we all get hot under the collar or under whatever. That might just be, the, what need, might be needed is a, is a, an, uh, is a f apology that's not, you know, uh, you know how, some, <laughs> I remember one time somebody, uh, somebody <laughs> came out of the blue. They had done something to me really bad years ago, and they came out of the blue and, you know, text me in the middle of a, of a Patriots game because they were a Patriots fan, and they basically act like nothing ever happened between of us, two of us. And that really bothered me. I was like, so I finally text the person back and says, you know, you know, you did this, this, and this, and you're acting like nothing ever happened between us. And then they will, you know, you, I said, you know, you never even, you know, you never even, uh, even, even offered an apology. And the person came back with this, you know, this, you know, they act, they said that they apologized. Then they turned around and basically negated everything they said. So they really weren't, what I'm trying to point is, don't say you apologize to someone and you really don't mean it because God sees that. You apologize, and you better be apologizing sincerely because God sees it if you're not. And people do this all the time. You think you see this with children but, and teenagers, but adults do this all the time. And you've probably seen it yourself, how people treat each other. So, again, don't misapply Psalm 51, verse 4. So in this way, uh, we see that people avoid the command of James 5.16 by mis misinterpreting Psalm 51, verse 4. James 5.16 says to confess your sins to one another. So in this way, again, these people who have misinterpreted Psalm 51 verse 4, they avoid the command of James 5.16 to confess your sins to one another. But to the contrary, we should interpret this passage where the confession of the offender's sin to the offended party takes place. What do I mean? Go, go to James chapter 5. Look at verse 13, James 5.13. It's amazing to me that you would think that, that uh, Christians, you would think that Christians, oh, I hope I didn't do that. Okay, good. All right, you would think that Christians, I thought, I, I thought it, my, my low, uh, Windows was saying, oh, I'm gonna re it's going to restart, you know, do updates and stuff, but I don't want it to restart. No, I'm teaching again. So anyways, I had, uh, J you know, so James, uh, J uh, I had, there's, uh, my point was people, it's amazing, and you could see it, understand it with unbelievers, but Christians, it's amazing how Christians can't apologize. Like, you, you know, and it's, you look like a fool when you don't apologize. I mean, I see it with husbands and their wives and wives and their husband, kids with their pastors get involved in this. You know, what is it to apologize for? You screwed up, you sin. It's almost like people, it's self-righteousness. It's like, I never do anything wrong. You know, they, don't, they can't be corrected. They can't say, they, they ever say they admit they were wrong about anything. And you look like a fool when you do that. You know, uh, what's the king's news clothes? Remember that? The guy's walking around the king. He's got nothing on. Oh, you're, you're, this new outfit you have, king, is great. Meanwhile, you're walking around, and you're naked, buck naked, and he's going through town, and they go, oh, look at the king's news clothes. He's got no clothes on. He's the, he thinks he looks great, and everybody around him knows he's got no clothes on. People do this all the time. You look like a fool. You ever see, you, I used to see this when I was at jobs I took, places, I, jobs I was at. And especially people in leadership positions. <laughs> I saw they could never admit that they screwed up. They never admit that they screwed up at ever. When is the last time? Here's another thing. When is the last time you can't find me? I, I, you'll have to look. I know where, how far you can look back. When is the last time you saw the President of the United States ever go to the American people and apologize? Tell me when. Ever. And you're telling me they, they're infallible? I'll tell you a president who did. John F. Kennedy. Came right out, and his approval ratings went sky high after that. The Bay of Pigs thing. 
even though he was not told the whole story there, he took the hit because he's the president and the buck stops with him. But he had to go before all those people. It was total embarrassment, one of the worst defeats ever. And he had to go up there because these knucklehead people under his authority weren't doing their jobs right. But he apologized to the American people. He apologized. He took the hit. All right? He was a, that's a real man. And David, you know, he go, when he was finally confronted with, from Nathan, when he sent, he took the hit. He was a real man. He owned up to it. Moses, he owned up to his failure when he, uh, he uh, called them uh, the, the Israelites rebels and struck the rock twice. You know, the great, the great men and women of God can own up to their mistakes, their sins. A, 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 a little person, a little man, a little woman can't fess up to what they did wrong. And you see this in the church all the time. It's tremendous pride that you can't, what is it to apologize? We sin in many ways, all of us. So, and especially if you're in a leadership position, I'll tell you what, it's not a sign of weakness that you apologize. In fact, the people under your authority will be very impressed with that. It looks most people with. I remember one time, uh, my pastor years ago, I don't know what, he, I don't even know what it was, and uh, I was out with his secretary and him. And we were out to dinner. Something happened and that night. And the next day, he, uh, he, he apologized. The pastor apologized to both of us. I had a tremendous amount of respect for the guy to do that. Because when you're in a position of authority, you don't want to look like you're ever wrong or you're ever at fault. You think it's a sign of weakness. Oh, come on. Get, we're all sinners. The presence of sinner. The pastor's a sinner. We all sin in many ways. The great apostle Paul, Peter, they all sin. The only one who never sinned was Jesus. The only one who never sinned. So we all sinned. So let's just stop playing around like we're perfect. And when we screw up with each other, just fess up to it. Say, I apologize. You know? Apologize to the wife when you screw up and you yell, you, you were, you're an idiot. Maybe she'll give you a lot of hugs and kisses that night if you're not, you know. So anyways, look at it. She'll love you even more. So James 5.13. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. <laughs> If I saw you look over there, that was pretty funny. Sorry. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. <laughs> he should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? Uh, good spirits? I'm in good spirits. He should pr sing praises. Is anyone among you ill? He should summon the elders of the church, and they should pray for him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So... Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is great effectiveness. But notice, so confess your sins to one another. So if you apologize, you're confessing your sin. Okay? I stole from you. I apologize. Here's the money back. Here's, in fact, I'll give you interest. Apologize. I slandered your name to people. I went around and I apologized to all those people that I did that to. And if you want me to go to each person with you, with my presence, fine, I will do that. Whatever it takes. So the, the, this is what confessing your sins to one another. And so the, this is what uh, we need to keep in mind when we talk about keeping our horizontal relationships, our relationship with people on, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place where uh, we're in fellowship, where we're not, we don't have unconfessed sin with relation to our fellow believer or our fellow human being. So, our Lord taught his disciples that if their horizontal relationships with people are not right because of sin, then they're not right in their vertical relationship with God. So that's why I say you can always tell somebody who's not right with God, look at the way they treat people. I never get, you know, the, you know, forgive me for bringing this up, but hey, I have to use experience and I have illustrations of things I've experienced in my life and I bring this up because I have a lot of things I've learned and saw when I went through the church split. And actually, I went to two over there. Two. And uh, when I survived in the second, the last one, I didn't. So, but anyways, when you, I, what I, was amazing to me is you could tell, I could tell people who were not having fellowship with God, and I knew that they weren't anyways. I knew that there were trouble already brewing there, and it just came out. I actually asked God to, you know, let's just get it all out, you know, in the open, and then sure enough, it did. I got what I asked for, and he showed me. He showed me what, what was really going on underneath there in their hearts. All I had to do is do a particular thing, and that just lit the fire up. And I found out from people, I found people who were not having fellowship with God by the way they treated me. And anybody who tried to back me, who defended me, 
I saw the way they treated people. I saw how they lied. I, heard, I saw how they were self-righteous, you know, protect my, they were protecting their integrity. They had no integrity. They were kidding themselves. When you go and mistreat people in the body of Christ and a pastor, what kind of, what, you crazy? And these people, these people were brutal. And they were not having fellowship with God. How do I know that? You don't have fellowship with God if you're mistreating people. You think God's having fellowship with you because when you are, when you are lying to somebody or being mean to somebody and stealing from somebody, slandering somebody? I mean, I had, I had somebody come out and say, uh, I, somebody came to me and said, did you see this email they sent out on you? I said, what's that? <laughs> and the email says that you're bankrupt. That's why you were, you know, you were this, that, and the other. I'm not bankrupt. I says I. I mean, I don't have a lot of money, but I'm not. I'm not bankrupt. You know. And then you know. So, <laughs> so they they did send it all to a bunch of bunch of people. Did did anybody ever apologize to me for that? Not a word. Nobody even asked if that was true. That sort of thing goes on. All of that. Are these people having fellowship with God? No, they are not. And they've involved. They're like the, the people like that are the Pharisees who put on a big facade for people. And they, oh, I'm so holy, and they, you know, they act like they're so. But then, when push comes to shove, if you go against them in any way, or you say you confront them in any way, they'll come after you, and they'll show you what their true colors are. Beware of that. You have to be aware of that. So that's how I say our Lord taught. I say this because our Lord taught his disciples that if their horizontal relationships with people are not right because of sin, then they're not right in their horizontal, their vertical relationship with God. You're sinning against your brother and sister in Christ, your fellow human being, you're not in fellowship with God. Don't doesn't matter what you say or do. It's that you you're back, you're showing you're out of fellowship with God by your poor treatment, your sinful treatment of people. So for instance, if we don't forgive our fellow believers, then God won't forgive us in the experiential sense, and thus we won't be restored to fellowship with God. Let me show you a passage that illustrates what I'm saying. And a lot of people get confused on it. And they it's really not confusing if you understand what he's saying here, but um, if you just read what he's saying and, and compare it with other scriptures. Look at Matthew 6. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew chapter 6. We'll pick it up at verse 5. Matthew 6, 5, whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray while standing in synagogues and on street corners so that people can see them. That doesn't mean if you publicly pray that you're a hypocrite. Sometimes we can't get around it, okay? You're praying for your food at, at dinner, and you're in a restaurant, okay? He's not talking about that. Truly, I say to you that they have their reward, but whenever you pray, he's talking about people who pray, and they want to be impressed. They're doing it to impress people rather than to simply speak to God, but whenever you pray, go in your room, close the door, and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think that by their many words, they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray this way. This is actually, they call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually the disciples' prayer, because he's teaching the disciples how to pray. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. So if you haven't forgiven somebody, let's say for instance like the people who were involved in that church, but if I don't forgive them, that God hasn't forgiven me? I'm out of fellowship, in other words, what he's saying. He's not saying you're going to hell or you're not saved. He's saying, I'm not going to have fellowship with you. He doesn't say anything about going to hell because of that. He's saying, yeah, I'm not going to have fellowship with you. Meaning, I, when, you, when, you, uh, when you go and you, uh, uh, you don't forgive other people, you have an unforgiving spirit, unforgiving, you're going to, I'm not going to have fellowship with you. 
I'm not, meaning I'm not, I'm not going to forgive you your sins in an experiential sense because you're sinning against me by not forgiving your brother and sister in Christ. Very, very important we see that. So let's continue forward. So if we have sinned and injured someone, whether his or her property or reputation, we must confess it to the injured party and offer restitution, which in some cases, restitution could simply involve an apology. And I said this before about our society today, which is uh, very litigious, very, a lot of slander going on in the media. You see it in sports. People, like I told you about the Brady thing, people will say all kinds of things about other people and people uh, on the, in the media and people out there who are gullible and uh, who are uh, in the audience, they believe everything that they hear. It's on television, and they believe, and they say they don't believe everything, but they do. They show it. They'll say, they'll say, okay, uh, they'll say, have an adopted attitude. It's not where do you get that attitude from? Because you've been listening to this person, this gossip columnist on television, and they have this opinion of the president, and you picked it up from them. But do you have any basis for that, having that attitude? It's what you know. People do this all the time. They'll believe everything anybody says about some badly about somebody else. So. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's people like, for instance, that I've seen them, they do it whether it's you're, the president is Republican or Democrat. People would say stuff about President Obama. It was a flat-out lie. I know it was a lie. And I'm not trying to support the guy or anything. And the same thing with Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and Reagan and Bush and all these guys. And they, when, you're in a, when you're, you're in a public person, you're the object of tax and people who are jealous and they'll say things. Don't believe everything you hear. If you don't have evidence for this accusation, you shouldn't even accept it. You shouldn't even listen. In fact, it says in First T uh, Timothy about the pastor, it says don't accept an accusation against an elder unless you have two more elder, unless there's two more witnesses. Don't even accept it. You know how many people are accepting uh, all kinds of uh, accusations against pastors when they don't have two more witnesses? They don't have any, any witnesses on it. I tell you, go back to the thing. I have people who there were supposedly accusations against me. I said, where are they? They never brought them against me. They never said anything. In fact, I went through the whole rigmarole through the whole thing. Well, we have to go through the, you know, what the word of God says, and we have to go through what the, the church constitution says. So bring your witnesses. Bring, get your accusation. Not one person showed up. How many months we went on with that thing? Two months? Shut up then. If you don't have any, these witnesses are not going to come forward against the person. Shut up. Don't listen to anything they say. You know what that means? That they don't want to come forth. That there's something going on. There's some kind of thing going on. They have an axe to grind with the person they're making an accusation against. Don't, don't believe everything everybody says to you about... Now, somebody probably thinking out there like, oh, there must be something going on with Pastor Bill. There's nothing going on with me. There's nobody around me for crying out loud. At the Thompsons, I'm a few people, other families. There's nobody around here. But you know, I'm just saying that people don't believe everything you hear. So if we send and injured someone, whether his or her property or reputation, we must, must confess it to the injured party and offer restitution, which in some cases, restitution could simply involve an apology, as I mentioned before. Sins against society, people, and against one another require civil restitution for experiential forgiveness before God and our fellow human being. Thus, the thief steals, realizes their sin, and confesses it to God, and their victim then makes restitution, and God forgives him. The divine requirement commands the believer to forgive the repentant offender. The death of Christ compensated God and the perpetrator compensates the victim by restitution. Let me repeat that. The divine requirement commands the believer to forgive the repentant offender. So if somebody sins against you, you've got to forgive them. The death of Christ compensated God and the perpetrator compensates the victim by restitution. The, slander, the slanderer libels and devastates their target, realizes their sin, confesses it to God and the victim, makes restitution, and God forgives them. So what I'm saying, there's a lot of things in the media today where people are making accusations against public figures and they're not being held accountable. They're abusing their privilege of freedom of the press and freedom of speech. People get accused. This is the thing that's amazing in this country, how stupid people are, right? Of course, they, when you don't have truth and you don't care about the word of God and you don't have any dying principles behind your thinking, this is what happens in your country. People are saying whatever they want today, social media, and there's no accountability. Yeah, we have free speech, 
but free speech requires, it's a responsibility and it's being abused. It's being abused with people slandering and libeling, committing, saying slanderous things about public figures and don't even have to be big public figures. All types of people and there's no, they're not being held accountable. If they don't have evidence for their accusation against the person they're speaking against, they should be stopped. That's the end of it. And that's why I say that these uh, newspapers and these uh, news agencies, if their people, reporters come on and come out with an accusation, I bet you their editor better have, better have, they better have enough uh, evidence and witnesses to back up the accusation, to support the accusation and go on the air with it. The editor better make sure of that. Because if I was owner of one of these news agencies or newspapers, I'd fire the editor and the writer. And that's not happening in our country today. Very rarely do you hear people, uh, 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 newspapers and news agencies and uh, TV networks issuing retractions. You see it, but not as much as you should. Because they're not, these people who are in the media, are not, now I'm not saying you do away with the media and freedom of speech. I'm not saying that. Listen to what I'm saying. These people need to be held accountable. And they need to not, not to abuse freedom of the speech by slandering people. Yeah, you can say what you want in this country, but no, you don't have the right, especially as a Christian, and as a human, to say something that's not true about another person. And, and, you, and, wh and how, what I told you before, people will believe everything. Everything. They'll believe everything that they see in the news, because some people are just stupid. What a, no other word to say it. Look up the definition. Stupid. They'll believe everything that they hear. And that's dangerous. No wonder Hitler got away with what he did. The bigger the lie, Hitler said, the more people believe it. So the Lord requires his people to forgive the repentance sinner, and the death of Christ compensates God, whereas restitution compensates the victim. Now, Leviticus 6, this is one last passage we'll go to. Leviticus 6 presents clear guidelines about the principles involved when one sins against God and another person. Go to Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1. This is the next to last passage. I forgot I had another one after it. Now, this is in the law. What he, what the, what's being said in Leviticus 6, 1 through 7, is in the law. Now, listen to me carefully. People get really confused about this. It's really not confusing. Yes, the law wasn't given to the church. But Paul said in Romans 7, the law is holy, righteous, and good. Paul also took some principles and the other apostles from the law and used them in their teaching of the New Testament. The law is not, the Old Testament is not negated okay, by the New Testament. Okay, the New Testament shows the fulfillment of the Old. The Old, a lot of times the right, the, like Jesus and the apostles would take stuff from the Old Testament and the law and bring it over into their New Testament doctrine, their, 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 their gospel, and to teach things. Because there are principles that we can learn, and this is one of them, with regards to restitution in Leviticus 6, that applies for it, that we can learn from and use, apply today as a principle. Leviticus 6, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. When a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by deceiving his fellow citizen in regard to something held in trust or a pledge or something stolen or by extorting something from his fellow citizen or has found something lost and denies it and swears falsely concerning any one of the things that someone might do to sin. When it happens that he sins and he is found guilty, then he must return whatever he has stolen or whatever he has extorted or the thing that he had held in trust, or the lost thing he has found, or anything about which he swears falsely. He must restore, look what he says, he must restore it in full and add one fifth to it. So let's say you, you, you stole $100 from your, your brother or sister in Christ, or a, a non-believer. You give back the $100 and add one fifth to that. So he says, he must restore it in full and add one fifth to it. He must give, to it, give it to its owner when he is found guilty. Then he must bring his guilt off. Then, 
See, notice again, it's just like Jesus taught earlier in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Then, after he's reconciled with his brother, his fellow citizen, then he says he must bring his guilt offering to the Lord. A flawless ram from the flock, convertible into silver shekels for a guilt offering to the priest. So this kind of tells you that if you sin, go, go uh, get, make it right with your, the person you sinned against and then go to God and confess it. So the priest will make atonement on his behalf before the Lord and he will be forgiven for whatever he has done to become guilty. So there is the, the, the teaching of restitution in the Old Testament and it's found in the New Testament. Go to one more passage and this is the last one for sure. Look at Luke 19. Look at verse 1. In the Gospel of Luke, Zacchaeus informed the Lord that he gave to those whom he had defrauded four times as much. He made, he made, he made amends. Look at Luke 19.1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. Now a man named Zacchaeus was there. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. So that's what tell you something. The tax collectors were Jewish guys. He was a Jew. And basically, the Jews considered him traitor because they were collecting taxes from the, Ro uh, the Jewish people from the Romans. And they hated the Romans. So he was, he was a, uh, and a lot of times, tax collectors skim money off the top. And he did that too, evidently. So they all did that. They made, put some money in their pocket and gave the ta thing to Rome. Okay? So that was going on all the time. So now a man named Zacchaeus was there, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. So he's a, he was a top tax collector, big shot. He was trying to get a look at Jesus, but being a short man, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, because Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, because I must stay at your house today. So he came down quickly and welcomed Jesus joyfully. And when the people saw it, they all complained. <laughs> all the Jewish people complained, because he's a traitor, this guy. What are you having fellowship with this guy? Look, he said, and he has gone into to be the guest. It says, the people saw this, Zacchaeus, Jesus greeting him. And they all complained, the people. He has gone into to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. This is the people talking about Zacchaeus and Jesus. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, half of my, look, he says, Look, Lord, half of my possessions... I now give to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone of anything, I am paying back four times as much. See, Zacchaeus believed in the doctrine of restitution. And Jesus, look what he says in response. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household because he too is a son of Abraham. He's saved. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. But notice Zacchaeus which was actually an exp uh, the way he said, you know, uh, applying the doctrine of restitution here to people he cheated. He was manifesting that he was saved. He was manifesting the fact that he was saved. Yeah, he's faith to do alone in Jesus Christ alone, but that, say, that salvation manifested in the way he now was treating people. Instead of defrauding people and stealing, cheating people and skimming money off the top and, 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 and probably strong-arming people, uh, he was making amends, and he was actually, he says, I'm paying back four times as much anything that I've cheated of somebody. That's, 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 see, if the church was practicing this, oh, we'd have, a, we'd have such great unity. And if our country would be doing things like this, what a great country we would have. But to do that, you have to have fear for the Lord. I mean, you have to have reverence and respect for the Lord to do that. Because, you know, always remember what will stop you from sinning against your fellow believer is fear of the Lord. A lot of times we sin against our, each other because we forget about who we're accountable to. And we should have reverence and respect for him as manifested by the way we treat each other. But if we do and we will sin, and if we sin against each other, whatever, if it's stealing, you pay him back and then add one fifth. If you, you slander them, go and apologize to them and the people you slandered them to, as I said before, make amends with them, patch up this guy's, rep this, his or her reputation, whatever it is, and anything like that. We need to be, we can't expect, God will not have fellowship with us if we're not right with our fellow believer or fellow human being. 
whether they're saved or non-saved. We're not right with them. We've sinned against that, that person. We're not going to have fellowship with God until we make restitution with those people we sinned against. Then we can have fellowship with God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson will be a blessing to your people. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.